Ja, wenn es draußen kalt und so richtig ungemütlich ist, dann gibt es verschiedene Varianten, wie man sich an dieser Kälte entziehen kann. Zum Beispiel fliegt man am besten einfach in die Ferien. Das ist aber teuer und man hat ja nicht immer Ferien, oder? man kann sich nicht immer vom Job entziehen. Dann gibt es noch die Variante, dass man zum Beispiel ins Solarium geht. Das kostet ein bisschen weniger, gibt einem auch ein bisschen Wärme. Oder, und das machen wir heute miteinander, wir träumen uns an einen Ort, wo es einfach ganz viel wärmer ist. Und zwar nehme ich euch mit in den nächsten 20 Minuten auf California. Wir schauen uns nämlich ein Making-of an von der Erfolgsserie OC California und da dürfen wir sich auf ein Wiedersehen freuen mit dem Marissa, mit dem Ryan und dem Seth. What a casting director does is get the script of the pilot and I break it down into characters starting with the series regulars. The bigger the role, the sooner I start looking. You have a certain conception of a character when you write it, and you know, usually it's based on some actor or actress that you've seen in a, a movie or something, or it's based on someone you know, and then invariably when you cast the show, you're casting someone different than you had in your head, and so naturally the part changes. With a show like The O.C. that has a large population of a younger cast, I also have to do a lot of pre-reads, which is having actors come in and read for me before the producers see them. When there's a large ensemble cast like this on The O.C., I think it's best to find the anchor of the show, and that's what I I think that the Peter Gallagher character of Sandy Cohen is on the show. I'm Sandy Cohen. I'm Ryan's attorney. Why was I chosen for the role of Sandy Cohen? I'm going to give you my card. And my home number. Call me. I guess I move fast. The first actor we cast was Peter Gallagher. And we wanted to really clearly state to both the studio and the network that we really intended to make the adult characters viable part of the show. And we wanted to cast someone who meant something. Jeez, I was just hoping for a free meal. I was open-minded about it and uh, met Marcia Schulman, from, who's casting director at Fox, and uh, she said, you know, I got a script I really want to send you. I said, all right. I read this OC script. Boy, I thought it was great. And I was right. Peter came in, and he was such a sweet guy and such a loving father and husband, clearly, that, you know, as soon as we started talking about the character, it was clear that this was a really good fit. You remember when we were 22? What'd you say? You said you'd never, you'd never be like your parents. You'd never have their life. I was 22. I stank of patchouli, and I lived in the back of a mail truck. And you were fun and rebellious, and, and, and you married me. When he came in to the network to read for all the people in charge at Fox, he was very charming and said, what do I need to do to get this job? This is it. This is a gift. I just thought, you know, there's a guy who, I thought they should have just offered it to him, but he was willing to do whatever it took, and which speaks of who he is as a person. After Peter, uh, Misha Barton was the next actor that we cast, and we'd known about her because she was in Fastlane, which uh, was a show that Wonderland also had produced. And I had written in the script that she was heartbreakingly beautiful and we needed someone who just would clearly be so far from Ryan's world. Marissa's sort of um, the girl next door who really isn't what she appears to be. She kind of seems like the perfect girl who's had everything she ever wanted growing up. She has a lot of friends and she's very popular and she comes from a wealthy family, but not everything's good about her too. She's got a lot of flaws. I mean, she's got a lot of weaknesses, and I think that's the kind of interesting thing about Marissa. We're from two different worlds. She was a 16-year-old girl sort of in this grown-up body, and there's a beautiful awkwardness to Misha, but I think that's the character of Marissa. Hard to believe you're not more popular. The other girls that I went up against, I think, were maybe more Southern Californian looking than me in the quintessential way. And um, they wanted to go against that because I think Marissa's cooler than that, really, in a way. Like, she doesn't exactly fit in. Like, she's not the product her mother quite wants her to be. But you will be. She's really beautiful. She's this really interesting mixture of someone who's and one moment a child, and at the next minute an adult, and it was sort of this really beguiling blend that you knew would just keep Ryan on his heels. You have no idea. And then after that, it was sort of like open season, and we saw so many Ryans and so many Seths and, you know, a couple of Kirstens, and, um, but Kelly Rowan came in and just had so much 
warmth. And in the beginning of the, in the pilot, she's the one that has to say no to Ryan. This is not a stray puppy, Sandy. You know, she was saying, no, Ryan can't come into the house, which made sense because as a mother, you get very protective as your cub, so to speak, to use a metaphor for it. You're endangering our home. Did you even think of Seth? So she just becomes this sort of fierce, you know, mother. She was able to sort of play that antagonistic character, but in a way where you really felt compassion for her and understood her point of view and understood why Sandy would be in love with her. Oh, she's so together, you know. The only thing she doesn't do is cook. <laughs> You're uncomfortably close to the corn right now. Can we just, can we back up a little bit? She goes to work, and she's doing charity functions, and she raises her family, and she takes care, I mean, she just takes care of everything. I just, I wish I had it together like that. So what are you doing now? You. Glad to hear it. There were roles that were hard, you know, the, the Ryan Atwood character that Benjamin McKenzie ended up playing. I thought we were never going to find that character. Then someone called me and said, that Benjamin McKenzie's, you should meet him, he's great. So he came in and he was great. So, you must be the cousin from Boston. Mm -hmm. Do you like Seattle? Did I hear you were from Canada? Yes, you did. I don't really know why I was given a shot. I think they were running out of options. They had about a week to go and they didn't have a kid. So they, uh, they said, what the hell, let's take a chance on a, on a guy who's never really done anything. It doesn't make me nervous to hire somebody new who doesn't have a lot of credits, uh, especially when the cast is this big and you are surrounding newer talent with established talent who can guide them and help them. But I just thought Benjamin sort of nailed it from the minute he walked in the door and sort of inhabited the character. Welcome to the dark side. Ben McKenzie came in to read for Ryan. We saw him standing on the sidewalk smoking a cigarette. He didn't say two words to us. We went into casting. He walked in, didn't say two words again. And, you know, we looked at him and we went, well, that's not really, you know, what we had in mind necessarily visually. Kind of looks like a young Russell Crowe. And then he opened his mouth and did the, the scene in Juvie Someone with Sandy, like where he meets Sandy for the first time. And he was so good. Somebody you know, he was... Um, a kid, but you felt like he had the soul of an adult. Let me tell you something, okay? Where I'm from, having a dream doesn't make you smart. Knowing it won't come true, that does. As I was reading the scene in the pilot where Ryan meets Marissa outdoors, the, uh, who are you, who are you? whoever you want me to be, kind of James Dean-esque moment, and, uh... Okay. Misha had already been cast, but was in New York, so I was auditioning with Patrick Rush, who's a wonderful casting director, but is 40-some-odd hey, years old and male. So he was playing Marissa's part, and I was playing Ryan, obviously, but uh, it was a little tricky to... Uh, he had to really go to a certain place to try to pretend like this 45-year-old guy was Misha Barton, but uh, he did a good job, and, and I liked it. There are often times you just have to read with who you have to read with, and if you can forget who that is and just be present and in the moment, and he was. I mean, I would have never known that Benjamin was uncomfortable having to read that scene with me. He never cracked under pressure. He got better every time he came in. Come on, let's go. Adam Brody came in and on his first audition, uh, improved the entire audition. It wasn't even close. So I went in, I didn't really learn it like I should have maybe. I didn't even recognize the, you know, the, the script is my own. And I'm sitting there going, who the hell is this guy? I didn't even know the script. So get him out of here. I think Josh's words were, I never want to see that kid again. Figured I'm just going to like get the essence of the character, do it. Sort of made up a lot of the lines pretty terribly. I don't think Josh liked it at all. Sometimes I think you talk just to make sounds. Well, sometimes I do. Adam took liberties with the material. And uh, I think it made Josh crazy. And... Uh, but there was something about Adam. There was something just genuinely interesting. No matter what he did with it, you kept wanting to watch him. And we couldn't find anybody. And so finally we're like, well, let's bring Adam back and see if we can get him to stick to the book. Oh, I get it. I'm just, I'm just here for the comic relief. A month later, they call me back, though. A month later, see, some, what, I don't know what happened in that month. Something happened. Because I was not immediately called back. But a month later, they called me back. You were lucky to be able to hang in there after all that foreplay. For what now? And, uh, you know, still did his, like, Brody special sauce on it. But, um, you know, obviously, that was a home run. Uh, 
um, for us as well. I think Josh's voice and Adam's voice are not far apart at all and their sense of humor and uh, who they are as people, I think they're very similar. And I think sort of, you know, autobiographically and sort of anecdotally, um, Seth is the character that sort of mirrored my experience at USC the most, you know, and it's been a really fun collaboration with Adam to, to bring that to life. Well, welcome to my world. Growing up, there was never any, like, if you were a Jewish kid, there's like no one really cool for you to kind of like look up to, who's like, you know, a young role model that you were like, hey, maybe I can, maybe there's hope. You know, I'd be that guy. Um, it was like five-ish Finkel. That's all we had. Um, and I think, you know, Adam Brody has given hope to young bar mitzvah boys out there across the nation. Way to take charge, Cohen. I always thought Josh was Seth Cohen. When I read the script, when I met Josh, and then when Adam Brody came in, that's why I kept fighting to bring him back, because I thought, and I always thought that character was going to turn out to be the one most people uh, fell in love with. Uh, what, what, what's happening here? I like Seth Cohen. The show's also filled with a lot of people who came on the show to do very small parts, who have established themselves now as series regulars, like Rachel Bilson, who plays Summer. I think she is one of my favorite characters on the show. I love playing my character because she has so many different levels. You know, she can be anywhere from shallow and snobby to loving and funny. You know what I mean? Just opposite ends of the spectrum. Sure, we're this week's hottest couple, but then the world gets sick of it. The shopping sprees, the strip clubs, people turn against us, okay? How many juicy sweatsuits does she need? Oh, that goatee is so mid-90s. And pretty soon, the movie bombs and the wedding is called off. And she's funny and, you know, a character that wasn't immediately likable, she has found a way to make her incredibly likable. I don't know anything about this guy, but I know... I'm Alan from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah, don't care. Rachel Bilstein's character, Summer, started out as, you know, just kind of the bitch. You say that like it's a bad thing. And she was so funny and really also very vulnerable and a really good dramatic actress that we were able to grow that character as well. She's a really well-rounded character and I get to do a lot with her, which I'm really grateful that the writers give me such great stuff. And Rachel Bilstein likes to say, uh, that she had me at ew. I mean ew. Uh, I've been in a lot involved in a lot of television shows. They all tanked, you know, they all like whoosh. So I figured, well, this poor show, if they cast me, it's gonna tank too. We wanted, we wanted desperately to fail. That's why we cast Tate Donovan. Either that or he's on some serious painkillers. I think I got the role of Jimmy because I'm an emotional wreck, and no. Um, I'm not too sure. I, I'm not too sure why I got the role of Jimmy. I often ask myself, God, why did they hire me? I, you know, it doesn't make any sense. You know, there's the fraud charges and the whole bankruptcy thing, and you know, I don't, even, I don't even have a job, so I'm not exactly a catch. I thought it'd be fun to play a dad. I mean, I, I certainly right. had never really thought about playing. I mean, I was like, you know, when I read the script, I was like, I'm the father of a 17 year old girl. <laughs> this is wrong. You set this to the wrong actor. I can start over, have a new life. I never really wanted to be a financial planner or a thief. Melinda Clark, who plays Julie Cooper, is just so funny and so likable that we're able to make Julie Cooper as outrageous as possible and know that Melinda will just sell that. What I'm doing is special. It's inspired. Julie Cooper is the mother of Marissa Cooper, the beautiful girl next door. I'm Marissa's mother. You're a student at the school. We can't do this. I mean, it's over? No, I mean in the hallway. This stereotypical a uh, wealthy woman whose only concerns are how she looks and how much money she has. So how was your weekend? You win the lottery? <sighs> I think they saw the opportunity to have her as this element that was not only, not classic villainous, but you know, the conflict in a lot of people's lives. The thing that Kirsten and Sandy are absolutely not about. This is Cotillion, the most important event of the year. Am I the only one who gets it? She's not played for comedy, but she becomes a lot of the comic relief, I think, because her, her, her actions are, and antics are so extreme. Sandy, hi, how are you? Oh, are you holding up okay? That poor boy, he's locked up, yes? And that's part of the show that's so unique, is the comedy through the drama. Oh, I got a motor. I don't want to be late for homeroom. You have homeroom? Right, because you're in high school. I think Melinda Clark, who plays Julie Cooper, has taken a character and made her just a character. Hey, you guys want to join us? We're celebrating my new position. Oh, I'm not going to touch that one. No, we're OK. I think her, her life is a constant succession of bad mistakes. I am not getting involved in the throes of teenage romance, thank you. And it's always affecting her daughter, and she just doesn't realize. Julie needs to be in therapy. So I'm going to go home and run a warm bath and either slip my wrists or drink a bottle of wine. Wine, definitely. 
One more, guys. Make this one it. Here we go. The cast of the OC and why does it work? I just think we got lucky. Where's, uh... Ryan's gonna stay with us now. That's awesome. It feels like a family. It feels like friends. It feels like people who love each other. It just has blended together, and I... It's just one of those times I think all the people came together. I'll unpack later. And I also think when that happens, you have to look at who's in charge. And if you know McGee, or if you know Josh Schwartz or Stephanie Savage, these are incredibly kind, nice people. I think that encompasses everyone on the set and cast. Well, there's a no-return policy now, you know that. I love you. Oh. You know that? California, here we come, right back where we started from. Music supervision is a lot more than just having a great record collection and a lot of imports and going to the record store all the time. It's about defining a sound with the creators and producers of the show, choosing music on an episodic basis every week, finding new songs, and legally negotiating the music. The music on the show is something that's critically important to me, and the idea for the music sort of my take on it was that the music was going to be expressing the characters sort of inner lives, you know, as opposed to trying to find Orange County bands and just try to play music that was representative of the location. I was more interested in sort of trying to shed light and illuminate light on the character's sort of psyche through the music. So, hey, it's a big test. You know what? Don't. There. When I first started watching the episodes, I was like, wow, the music's awesome. Who's the, who's the music supervisor? And I, I met her, and she's um, extraordinary. And so I got like, on the list of, of CDs, you know, so I get a duplicate of like, all the CDs that the writers listen to, and like, will we put this song in the show kind of thing. And uh, it's awesome. For the first six or seven episodes, we didn't really have a music supervisor. So it was kind of everything that was on my iPod. And then that dried up pretty quick. Um, and Alex came in, Alex Pasavas came in, and she is just, we have really similar sensibility, but she's just really great. I mean, she, she just knows everything that's out there, stuff that's not even out yet. I was able to work with a creative team who was really interested in stretching the boundaries. And we've been given the go ahead to sort of look in all places for our music and it's been incredibly freeing. We go to sleep to shake a beer, we wake up on our own. That's the way we get back to the way we get back. All that inspiration for this show comes from college radio. I work right across from a record store. I'm there all the time. Sometimes music just comes to mind very quickly and sometimes it's sort of a hard one process where I try many, many songs before something jumps out and is perfect for the scene. The song on the Ferris wheel when it's the first time that Marissa kisses Ryan. I can't remember who it's by, but it's just like, you know, those were big moments, like the song was specifically picked. Look, maybe you just need something to take your mind off of it. Oh, 50 feet in the air. How do you expect me to possibly? Heute Abend um 20 Uhr zeigen wir John Frankenheimers Schwarzer Sonntag. Der Action-Thriller handelt von einer Splittergruppe der palästinensischen Terroreinheit Schwarzer September, die einen Anschlag in den Vereinigten Staaten plant. Ziel ist das vollbesetzte Footballstadion von Miami. Anführerin Dahlia will damit auf die Not des palästinensischen Volkes aufmerksam machen und spannt für ihren Plan den Luftschiffpiloten Lander ein. Gegenspieler der beiden ist der israelische Agent Kabakov, der das Blutbad mit allen Mitteln zu verhindern versucht. Um 23 Uhr zeigen wir Nachtblende. Ein französisches Filmdrama mit Romy Schneider in der Hauptrolle. Die Geschichte handelt von einer Dreiecksbeziehung im Milieu der französisch-italienischen Mafia. 
Nadine ist eine erfolglose Schauspielerin, die in die Soft-Porno-Industrie hineingerät, um ihr Überleben sichern zu können. Bei Dreharbeiten lernt sie den Fotografen Servet kennen, der sich sofort in sie verliebt. Dieser ist dermaßen angetan von der jungen Frau, dass er ihr über Kontakt eine Rolle in einem Theaterstück verschafft. Dazu muss Servet allerdings Geld von der Mafia leihen. Nadine ist hin und her gerissen zwischen Servet und ihrem Ehemann Jacques, dem sie sich moralisch verpflichtet fühlt. Ja, ich hoffe, ihr habt es genossen. Das Making of von OC California ist ja schön, wenn man sich ein bisschen an einen wärmeren Ort kann wegdenken kann. Wenn es eben so kalt ist, muss man nicht immer ins Solarium, sondern kann einfach ein Making of schauen von OC California. Wir sehen uns morgen wieder, wenn ihr wollt, um halb sieben hier bei der Star News. Bis dann, macht's gut, geniessen den Feierabend. Bis bald und tschüss.